Virginia Tech and UVA ride their defenses to Week 1 victories. What does the Hokies' upset of North Carolina mean going forward? And what should we make of the ACC's first week of the new college football season? All that, Aaron McFarling's Puppy Chow, this week on Teal and Barber. Welcome in to episode 57 of Teal and Barber, the Richmond Times Dispatch and Richmond.com's Virginia Tech, UVA, and ACC Sports Podcast. I'm Mike Barber, ACC beat writer for the paper, and joining me here, as he always does, my co host, the 13 time sports writer of the year and the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, David Teal. David, how are you? Good morning. Well, hope you're the same. I am, I am, and I, I have to ask, uh, how did it go with the, the Big Teal Family Seafood Festival? I had a grand time on Sunday. Went through about a, a bushel of crabs, 10 pounds of fish, a few pounds of shrimp. I don't know how many pounds of barbecue and uh, countless other sides. So uh, much fun was had. And much food. That sounds fantastic. You know, it's funny. I, I was thinking to myself, um, and I may have tweeted this thought um, because that's what we do in the year 2021. If we have a thought, we tweet it because everyone needs to know it. Um, is there a a holiday whose leftovers are, are less, I don't know if healthy is the right word or good for the diet. I, I was looking at my Labor Day cookout leftovers and I've got meat and carbs. I've got <laughs> steak and sausage and I've got potato salad and pasta salad. And it, it just feels like, I don't know, Thanksgiving and Christmas. There's always a vegetable. And even if it's, you know, a green bean casserole that maybe isn't the healthiest vegetable, but this was just straight red meat and carbs. And I thought, man, I'm going to be eating that for the next two days. And I'm okay with that because it's delicious. But uh, from a health standpoint, I, I think summer cookouts might have uh, the least health value with their leftovers. Maybe you can chop up some of that red meat and throw it over a bed of spinach, Mike. What do you think? You know, we have spinach, but that just sounds like ruining the red meat. But <laughs> we, we are going to get a little creative. I think tonight we're going to do uh, steak fajitas. So we'll have some peppers and onions and mushrooms uh, to go with some of the leftover steak. And uh, we try to repurpose it so it's not the exact same meal uh, day after day. But I love, I'll be honest, I, I love summer cookout side dishes, as bad as they are in terms of being carb loaded. Um, I love potato salad. I love pasta salad, mac salad. I love all of that. So uh, having that in the house, it will be hard for me to resist. Uh, no, thank you. We, 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 we tend to give that stuff to the, to the guests and tell them to take it on home. That's that's the smart way to do it, and and believe it or not, we did that with probably fifty percent. But uh, I am a classic over server. Um, too much food, too much side dishes, too much everything. Um, so we have plenty left. The only thing that got completely eaten, actually, ironically, now that I think about it, uh, a friend made a really good uh, pickled beet red beet salad um, with goat cheese, and that was excellent and relatively healthy, and uh, that was all gone. So. <laughs> So this will be a, a less than healthy week in, in the Barber household. <laughs> uh, a very healthy start to the season for Virginia Tech. They, they win that supersized opener we talked so much about uh, against Coastal Division preseason favorite North Carolina. Uh, you know, there was a lot of concern, and we talked about, hey, you come out, you lose this game, especially if you don't play well, the, the season might spiral, right? Make it away from you. Now, David, I don't know what the reverse of a spiral is, but <laughs> it, it seems like things are pointed in the, you know, the right direction in Blacksburg. 17-10 win, a dominant showing, I thought, by the Hokies' defense. Uh, so, David, let's start before they ever kick things off down there in Blacksburg. We talked about, hey, this might be a vintage Lane Stadium atmosphere Friday night. We were both there for the game, and, and David, I, I thought it really was. Starting with the hideous traffic on I-81. <laughs> it, it, Back it to was, normal. It, yep, it was, it was vintage Virginia Tech football. Now, it was – Lane Stadium was – it was a – it wasn't the difference maker Friday night, but I'll tell you what, the crowd definitely gets an assist because they were up all game. They were loud – the even the the little corners up in the upper deck on each side that are normally vacant uh uh-uh. uh they were packed out that was a legit sellout crowd and man it was it was great to see it made for fabulous television and really did help the hokies 
Yeah. And when we talk about that, we'll just call it a reverse spiral. Um, everybody shows up. Everybody missed football. Everybody wants to be in lane. Everybody wants to cheer. But the home team has to give you something to cheer about or that fades. And David, they gave them plenty to cheer about. And let's start with certainly cheer worthy, that defense, six sacks, three interceptions, effectively ended Sam Howell's Heisman <laughs> campaign on night one. Um, we talked about it, and I expected this defense to be a lot better and Justin Hamilton to have a better foundation in place. I don't know that I expected that from them on opening night. What did you think of the defense? Well, I assure you, I did not expect Virginia Tech to limit North Carolina to 10 points. No way, no how. And, and Mike, just to go back to your first point about you know giving the crowd – reason to immediately stay engaged mm -hmm. and, and we can get to the offense later but i thought that opening drive mm -hmm. just going down the field and scoring a touchdown right out of the chute that that was the perfect start because you, you'll recall last year in chapel hill tech is down 21 nothing before sam howell's even gotten loosened up yeah and that thing was sideways from the start had that happened friday night the crowd's on its hands and you never know how it goes from there, but but to your point about the, the defense, they were they were especially good up front and in the secondary, just exceptional. I mean, and it wasn't just the six sacks; they were in Hal's grill all night. He was always on the move, never comfortable, and that's how you handle an elite quarterback: make him have happy feet make him uncomfortable. Yeah, and we've said it so many times on, on this podcast and, and anywhere anyone asks, but um, the first 11 on defense have the potential to be really good. And, and the way Tywan Garbett played at end, right? We expected our Amari Barno to have a breakout year and, and for them to be good, he has to. And he was great. He was great against the Tar Heels. But Tywan Garbett was every bit as good, uh, every bit as disruptive, if not more. Um, again, we have concerns about the depth. We have concerns if they, if they can stay healthy or not. But man, that first 11, uh, and you mentioned the secondary. I'm glad you did because Jermaine Waller, who they pretty well, I mean, they locked at times on, on Josh Downs. They moved Waller down to cover in the slot and um, had him playing man-to-man -man on, on Josh Downs. They had him on the outside. Um, he played all over in the secondary uh, and always kind of on an island and really held up. But I thought Dorian Strong and Armani Chapman, uh, when they had their moments, I thought they held up uh, in one-on-one -on -one coverage. And um, that was maybe another area that we were curious to see. So um, everything we felt um, on the positive about the first team defense really showed up. And hey, if they play that way and they stay healthy, this could be a really exciting defense to watch this year. It could be. And there was also some depth displayed, especially defensive tackle. You know, they, they ran four guys out in and out of there, and all of them were really good. You know, we remember the sack that Mario Kendricks had mm -hmm. just out of a out of a three man pressure, where he knocked Carolina out of field goal range. Jordan Williams was really good. You know, Fuga came in and, and had some moments. Narelle Pollard had the tip pass that mm -hmm. Dax, that Dax Hollifield intercepted. So there were contributions even from the second teamers. Yeah, and I think you feel better about the interior defensive line depth yes. uh, than the ends. But again, hey, Barno and, and Garbett playing a huge number of the snaps were dominant, and it might just be a situation where a couple weeks into the season, we feel better about that depth, right? You're still bringing guys along. That process, um, while it can't be the focal point because you're getting ready for opponents, it's still happening and guys are still getting more comfortable and, and, and more versed in what they're supposed to be doing. So um, all positive on that end. Now the offense, the offense wasn't electrifying. It wasn't maybe what we have envisioned and, and may still get going forward. But David, in terms of the way they played, especially in that first half, they really set this team up and the defense up for success by controlling the game. Milking the clock. Yeah. I mean, how many times did they run the play clock inside five seconds? I mean, almost every snap, right? Mm -hmm. 
And it, and it was a very calculated decision, a very smart decision. What, what was Justin Fuente's remark? As much as he likes Sam Howell's game, he wanted him to spend most of the night on the sideline. Yeah, that's the way to do and it. And that's essentially what, what they did, especially in the first half. I think in the first quarter, yeah. Virginia Tech had the ball for like 12 and a half minutes. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, it was crazy. And that's and that's one sure way to hold a team such as North Carolina to, to well under its expected scoring average. So in that, in that way, the offensive line, the running game, Braxton Burmeister's game management, really good in the first half, not so much in the second, where the defense time after time after time had to come through. And in, in recent seasons, it hasn't. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that's maybe an underappreciated part of how the way the game played out. And this isn't a criticism at all, but the Virginia Tech defense didn't have to play the first quarter. <laughs> um, they were really only yeah. asked to play three quarters of a game, which means what we're worried about, about rotating defensive ends. Well, they weren't out there playing as much as maybe normal, as many snap because they had that first quarter. So they just were fresher in the second half when you're right. Um, the offense left them in some tough spots. Now, we did see some some glimpses, um, <laughs> a, a sort of humorous touchdown pass uh, from Burmeister to Mitchell, which we both thought at the moment was this amazing throw. I mean, right kind of, you know, rifled through some traffic. And when you started looking at it, you realized, was he throwing it to Mitchell or Tavian Robinson? And I thought Burmeister was, uh, was a, gave a great answer when we asked him about it. And he said, you know, I saw both those guys and I knew one of them would catch it. Yeah. Well, Fuente was convinced that it was intended for Robinson and that Mitchell just went up and got it. Well, and when you have athletes and playmakers that can do that, hey, it's still it's still seven points, right? Correct. It's not uh, it's not like when you're playing pool and you got to call your shot. <laughs> the ball goes in, they're counting it. So that that was uh, impressive. I think we saw some things from uh, Raheem Blackshear. I think we saw some mm-hmm. tough runs from Jalen Holston. Um you know, maybe not huge breaking around, but short yardage converting. And, and that's such an important part of the game of football. Um, and Holston, I thought, showed a real knack for that uh, Friday night. I think if I recall correctly, Mike, and I don't have the play-by-play in front of me, they might have converted three third and ones in in the first half. And, oh, by the way, they converted their first six third downs. Another huge, huge part of controlling the clock. Yeah, and then they they finished six for thirteen. So to your point of uh, how things trailed off, but yeah, it, it is. And and I thought so that sign from the traditional run game I thought was positive. Uh, I thought Burmeister looked in control, and um, I think the offense is going to be better. I think that Carolina defense is pretty good. Mm-hmm. David, I, I came away, you know, we talked about, hey, they're improved in the secondary and they've got some playmakers and they've got some veteran guys uh, at, at every level. Um, I thought that showed up more than any deficiency with the tech offense. Agreed. And I also think that Carolina's offensive line is really good. <laughs> and the Hokies defensive front own them. Yeah, Dax Holyfield had a great quote. He said, uh, I'll take our four over any five, I think he said, in the country. And um, the way they played in that one, I, I get it. And um, no doubt, you know, Justin Fonte had, a, I, I thought, a interesting comment when I asked him about, you know, people not expecting his defensive line to fare as well against these five returners and all the talent Carolina had up front. And he said to me, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, hey, we have all our guys back too. Mm-hmm. And I think our guys are pretty good. Um, and it's hard to argue with that the way they played in this one. Well, and also what Fuente and several of the players noted was they essentially heard for six months how good Carolina is. And I think it really stuck it in their craw. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the way they lost last season. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I wrote the story that they, they were playing the quote unquote highlights the big Carolina plays, that's what was on the TV when these guys were lifting weights all off season, right? So it's it wasn't one of those put it behind you and move on. It was, you know, somebody asked me, hey, going into the game uh, in out-of-town radio, they asked me, um, do you think it's in the back of their mind the way last year's game unfolded? And I said, no. I said, it's in the front of their mind. It, it's right there in their eyes and it's been there. And, and you're right. I think that played into it. David, the reason they kept hearing that was, Carolina was the preseason favorite in the Coastal, top 10 in the AP poll. This was the team that was supposed to 
potentially rival Clemson if it was going to happen. Well, now that narrative's out the window. So, David, what is the outlook in the Coastal Division where there isn't a team on that half of the league that has a better win on its resume than the Virginia Tech Hokies? I don't think there's a team in the league with a better win on their resume than the Virginia Tech Hokies. And it's not even particularly close. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the two teams that were picked one and two in the preseason poll both lost. I mean, Carolina loses to the Hokies, and no surprise, Miami loses to Alabama but was non-competitive, mm-hmm. lost by 31, and it was a blowout from the jump. So, yeah, maybe we're looking at coastal chaos. Maybe Virginia Tech and or Virginia are the class of the coastal. Maybe Pitt's really good. You know, we, we just don't know. But after one week, there's no question who has the best win in the league. Now, with that, it flows into the next question. Does this set us up for a letdown <laughs> when Middle Tennessee State comes to Lane Stadium? Because I don't know if the crowd is going to have the same enthusiasm. It's a different... Yes, yes, you do, Mike. <laughs> yeah, they won't. I was being nice. <laughs> yes. They're not going to be able to match uh, their first game in over a year, a night game against a top 10 opponent with this game against Middle Tennessee State. And we have seen in the Justin Fuente era, and honestly before, Virginia Tech, struggle with success and and Mm -hmm. follow a really good win with either a subpar performance or gasp a loss. So Mm -hmm. is that what we're set up for here? Certainly possible. You know, the Hokies are 19 point favorites. They almost certainly will be ranked when the polls come out later today, today being Tuesday. And they have West Virginia next week on the road. So in in that regard, this is the classic trap game. Middle Tennessee State, who's that? What league do they play in? What's their nickname? Well, Justin Fuente knows. He played Middle Tennessee State when he was the coach of Memphis, and they were in the same conference. Middle is you know not highly regarded this season in Conference USA to start. Picked fifth in its division. Uh, hasn't had a winning season in a, in a few years. So we'll, we'll see. But there'll be a familiar face under center, Bailey Hockman, the, the transfer from NC State, who started last year's opener, mm-hmm. Lane Stadium, threw a couple touchdown passes, if, if memory serves. Yeah, it's uh, it's not a great Middle Tennessee State team or, or hasn't been of, of late. Um, I think, though, the narrative, because you're hearing it everywhere, oh, Tech is, is set up for a letdown. I think that helps. Right. Because I I think it just like it irked the players that nobody was giving them a chance against Carolina. I think the fact that everybody's saying, hey, they're they're going to spit up their lunch now that they've had a chance to eat it. I, I think that that is now sort of becomes a rallying cry, certainly not to the level and not months and months. But um, I think if you hear it enough, it does set in and, and it makes you think, OK, you know, we need to do something because, hey, maybe this season can be something special. And you don't want to go and throw that away in week two. How special could it be? Well, that brings us to this week's edition of Who You Got. Thank you, Mike. It is Who You Got. And David, let's start with you. We're going to talk a little bit more about that coastal chaos (laughs) that uh, Mike mentioned. Now, the Virginia Tech has knocked off North Carolina, uh, who was the preseason favorite in the coastal division. Which team is the favorite to take the division crown now, Uh, David? North Carolina. I'm I'm not gonna, I'm resisting overreaction and a couple plays here or there and North Carolina wins the game. I'm going to stick with my preseason choice and see how it all plays out. Thank you David, Mike. That's probably the right answer, right? They were the best going in. The thing is what I saw from Virginia Tech is what changes it for me. I saw a defense that can win the division. Now, the question is, which way does this go? If Virginia Tech plays the way they played, defensively especially, in that opener, I can see them going out and winning the division. If the whole thing descends into that coastal chaos that we're so used to, and it's anybody's game, I think you revert back to what David's saying. And who did you think was the best coming in? If there's chaos and it's not going to be, nobody's going to run away with the division. Uh, nobody's going to win seven games or, or eight games. It's If that's not what we're looking at, 
then yeah, I, I, I'd say if it's a mess, I see Carolina. But for right now, I'm going to say it's Virginia Tech because I think that defense can play that way all year, asterisk, if they stay healthy. <laughs> Big asterisk, right? Now, another team that, that would benefit, I think, from <laughs> dissension into chaos, UVA. They won the opener. Defense, even more dominant, albeit against a, a far less daunting opponent. They played FCS, William & Mary. David, we were both at Scott Stadium as well after uh, braving the 81 traffic again to get up there. Uh, I thought the atmosphere was really good at Scott Stadium too, especially, David, I was struck by the turnout of the students who were there early. Um, they stayed fairly late into the final quarter, and, and I thought they were energetic. Yeah, the students were really good. The, the, the rest of the crowd was meh. meh. Yeah. And the upper deck was virtually barren. But uh, yeah, and, and Bronco Mendenhall made note in his post game that the students, you know, burst through the gates literally as soon as they opened. And he said he'd never seen that in his five, now sixth year at Virginia. He talked about how, how special that was. So in, in, in that regard, yes, impressive crowd. Now, on the field, what was your biggest takeaway from from that opening win, 43 nothing, And um, there were a lot of things that, that went well, some things that we questioned. What was your biggest takeaway? I think, Mike, the, the longer the game went on, the better Virginia became, which is what you would expect against a veteran team and or, or no, what you would expect from a veteran team, especially against an FCS opponent. By, by game's end, William and Mary was spent. Hmm. I mean, guys are cramping after almost every snap, especially on defense. You know, the, the, the depth became such a factor. And that's 85 scholarships against 63 scholarships. Mm -hmm. And I, I know the scholarship limits are waived for this year, and you've got super seniors and such. I get all that. But still, <laughs> the cupboard is much better stocked in Charlottesville than it is in Williamsburg. No doubt. It's, it's not even, even though you're right, there is some relief there. David, defensively from Virginia, we saw them – Stick with the odd front, but play more of that three-three-five alignment that, frankly, a lot of teams nationally are, are going to, even if it's not what they're calling their base. Um, it gets more speed on the field. It gives you a little more matchup ability with that fifth defensive back, especially when they're playing guys um, you know, who can move. Devontae Cross was the guy who played that fifth spot. Well, he's been a corner. He's been a safety. He's been a nickelback. So that tells you kind of what they're getting on the field. Um it's certainly, at least for week one, it certainly worked out pretty well. It did. And to, to me, the most visible, the guy I noticed most in the UVA secondary the other night was Joey Blunt. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was like a missile chasing down guys. And he, did, he looked so healthy and so fast, which he wasn't last year. What did he play, five of the ten right. games? Yep. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. And he, he just, that's a guy who, who has all ACC talent if he just stays healthy. Yeah. Now it's interesting. One of the things they did was they moved Nick Grant, um, who's had his uh, rough games at corner. They moved yeah. him to safety, uh, playing alongside Blunt. That seemed to work pretty well. Um, they moved a younger kid into the lineup, Fentrell Cypress, the second, who's a, a sophomore and, um, they played some, but but not a ton. Um, had dealt with some injuries, um, and they and they and they looked pretty good. Anthony Johnson, the transfer from Louisville, he was the other starting corner. Um, that worked out. Darius Bratton played some snaps, but uh, it looks like and and you know we hear this from coaches all the time. But Broncos said this on Monday. You're trying to get your 11 best players on the field, and um, I guess I'm a little surprised because you give up a linebacker position. Right when you do this, when you go to the three-three-five, it, it comes out of the linebacking core. Uh, but certainly, like I said, against William Mary, uh, it, it paid off and, and worked very well. It did, and we'll, we'll see how it, how it plays earlier. But when they released the depth chart yesterday for the Illinois game, you know, it did list the the, the five defensive backs. Yeah, and sometimes I'm starting to feel like those depth charts are, are a little regressive. <laughs> it's like, here's what was last week's lineup. Um, Illinois interests me because they play a lot of what we call 12 personnel, right? Two t tight ends on the field. Um, they like to get out wide with the run, running the ball. Um, a lot of that old Indianapolis Colts stretch play. Um, so is 
a team that's going to try to run it and be big like that is the three three five the way you want to go for that, or might we see more uh, true linebackers and um, you know guys like Noah Taylor, Elliot Brown, Hunter Stewart, they, they can play inside and out. Um, so and Nick Jackson was just a stud in the William and Mary game inside. He was in on so many tackles. He finished with about a dozen. Um, so I'm curious to see if that depth chart isn't a little regressive of here's what we did last week, but it might look different this week. Um, but certainly the option is there and they've certainly put on film um, the ability to play. If this was basketball, we'd say play a small lineup. And Illinois, I mean, no, no surprise that that's how the Illini want to play under Brett Bielema. Right. Because that was his trademark at Wisconsin. And the Badgers thrived so much, so much so when he was there that he bolted for Arkansas where it didn't work out so well. But uh, he's, he's back in his wheelhouse in the Big Ten. But Illinois is a long way from where he needs it to be. I mean, Mila and I were picked last in the Big Ten West this season. And after opening with a win over Nebraska, you know, then gives up 37 and a loss to Texas San Antonio at home on Saturday. Yeah, we talked about um, struggling with success <laughs> with, with Virginia Tech. How about that? Because yeah. that is... Illinois win, I think, grabbed a lot of people's attention. Not that they were going to be, you know, college football playoff bound, but hey, they were going to be competitive right quick, right out of the chute. And then all of that good feeling, they just turn around and give it back. So what do we make of of Illinois? This is no doubt a massive step up in competition uh, from an FCS opponent. But do we have a good handle on who Illinois is going to be when they hit Scott Stadium early, (laughs) early in the morning on this one? Well, and even earlier for Illinois. Right. That's 10 o'clock their their time. So even even more challenging, at least it would be for me, <laughs> just to just to be putting the pads on that early. Uh, Virginia is a ten point favorite, and I think for a reason. Uh, it's it's a game that if the Cavaliers have serious aspirations of returning to 2019 form, it's a game you got to win. Yeah, agree a hundred percent. I thought that ten point line w- was higher than I expected, but what do I know? Let's bring on now a guy who does know all about that kind of stuff. Back again for another round of giving us some pointers and some guidance in our uh, newly legalized sports betting <laughs> venue. It's Aaron McFarling, the outstanding columnist from the Roanoke Times and good friend here of the podcast. Aaron, how are you? I'm good, Mike. Uh, it was a good weekend last weekend. We we won our upset of the week. That's always important, especially when you're starting a new feature like I am in the Thursday paper. Uh, you don't want to blow that one. The Penn State got it done, and they won outright, so that was very nice. Uh, made a little bit of money myself, and I'm hoping the uh, listeners and the readers made a little bit of money too. Yeah, if you're following along uh, in the Roanoke Times online and, and obviously getting Aaron's advice here, uh, you're one to know too, so smart, smart decision to follow along. Well, let's not waste any time. Let's right get to the, the puppy chow of the week here and, and, and tell me. Let's start with the Commonwealth schools. Virginia Tech, they are a large favorite, 19 points at home against Middle Tennessee State. Aaron, I, I actually thought the line might be bigger. Uh, what do you make of this one? Yeah, I, I thought it would be bigger too. Uh, you know, Middle Tennessee won 50 to 15 over FCS member Monmouth in week one. Uh, but I'm not going to let that fool me. I mean, this is not a good program right now. I mean, they were seven and 14 over the previous two seasons. I think the Hokies are prepared against a letdown. They've had some serious letdowns under Justin Fuente. It's been a problem. Uh, so I understand why, you know, if you're a tech fan, you might be skeptical going into this one. But I'm going to make the assumption that they've learned their lessons and they're a, a superior team here. And I think they're going to win by about 32. I'm going with Virginia Tech 42, Middle Tennessee 10. So the offense didn't really distinguish itself in the big upset of North Carolina. Now, they did some nice things in the first half to keep the football. Are you anticipating in this matchup that the offense kind of gets in gear? I am, but I think I'm looking more at how their defense carries over. You know, if I'm Virginia Tech, I want to start start reestablishing that defense as a monster. You know, I mean, it's it's been many years since it's been a week-in, week-out monster. So uh, allowing more than 10 
to 14 points, I think would be a very disappointing result here for, for the Hokies. So that's, that's the thing I'm going to be keeping an eye on, but yes, I definitely think, I mean, they're not going to be, you know, putting it down the, the, the uh, field like they were in that game against UNC trying to run time off the clock the entire time. So uh, they'll, they'll run some up tempo stuff and I think they'll get in a rhythm. And I think uh, Burmeister's hungry to uh, come out and show he's better than he was in that second half. Good stuff. Now, another team that that's defense just was really outstanding, granted against a, a much lesser opponent. Virginia shut out William & Mary week one. Their defense did a lot of good things. Again, obviously a matchup where you'd expect them to do that, but a shutout is still a shutout. They are a 10-point favorite uh, at home against Illinois, an Illinois team that I imagine, Aaron, for you and for everyone is a little hard to figure out. They uh, beat Nebraska week one and then get beat by uh, UT San Antonio in, in week two. So tell me, 10 points, I thought that was high. Where, where do you fall on this one? I actually like UVA here. I'm going to take them to cover. I, I like the Cavaliers at home right now. I mean, they, they've just proven to me that they can they can play well there and win there. And, uh, you know, the Brett Bielma era is going to take some time, uh, the, as they show. that we, we talked about letdowns with Virginia Tech. That's a letdown when you're a four-point chalk against UTSA and you can't get it done after beating Nebraska in a very uplifting performance in, in week zero. And uh, that was an uplifting performance for my bankroll, too, so I appreciate it. But, um, you know, they, they – they came back to earth, and I think uh, you know going on the road here, uh, you know while they're still rebuilding, they're they're going to run into uh, a team that that can can handle them. I'm going to take the Cavaliers here, 37-24. Sounds good. And then, as far as your upset of the week, I think we've got a, a familiar name that that listeners are going to recognize, and a line that that Aaron jumped out to you, right? Oh, absolutely. And people will tell you, you know, hey, be be wary of those fishy lines. You know, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Well, I'm not going to subscribe to that. I'm just going to go with my gut here and say that this <laughs> South Carolina line, they're getting two points at East Carolina. And I've been to East Carolina many times. I hope he's played there a lot. It's a good atmosphere when the team is good. That is not a good Pirates team right now. Since the start of the 2015 season, ECU has been a total pushover. I mean, they've gone 21 and 14. 49 over that span. I mean, that is not good. And, and uh, I mean, I know uh, the rebuilding effort from Shane Beamer in South Carolina is going to take some time. I'm not, I'm not anticipating they're going to win a whole bunch of SEC games this season. I'm not going crazy uh, with, with Shane Beamer fever here, but I think they're a better team. They've got better players. Um, ECU is, you know, they have a veteran quarterback, but he hasn't won anything there. Um, so I'm going to take the two points. In fact, I'm going to take the money line. That's typically what I do in situations like this. So you'll probably get them about plus 110, maybe as much as plus 120 at some places. And uh, I say roll the dice there, man, and, and uh, root for the boy from Blacksburg to get this done. And a, a week ago, if you followed his advice, you won the upset game this week at South Carolina. So follow along and, and see if Aaron can go 2-0. and Aaron, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mike. Good luck, everyone. Well, David, I think you and I will both be uh, interested to see how, how things go for Shane Beamer and, and South Carolina this season. That will be uh, a fun storyline to watch. We were also really interested to see what the ACC was going to be all about this year. Clemson certainly getting things started with with the nation's marquee game. Uh, that didn't go the ACC's way. Florida State gave a really good showing against Notre Dame, but the final score doesn't go their way. North Carolina, who was supposed to be the standard bearer in the Coastal, we already talked about Tech getting them. Uh, the bottom of the league, David, Duke and Georgia Tech didn't do the league any favors in terms of perception uh, with a couple of ugly, embarrassing losses. So what are we making of the ACC after week one? I'm not sure it could have gone much worse, really. I mean, mm -hmm. The ACC is, is now, you know, had three chances playing top 10 non-conference opponents. You know, Clemson played Georgia, Florida State played Notre Dame, Miami played Alabama. I think even the most optimistic ACC fan would have said one and two, probably two and one at best. Mm -hmm. Instead, it was 0 oh and three, dropping the ACC in its history to two and 41 all time in openers against top 10 non-conference opponents. How about that stat? You know, and then, you know, your three ranked teams, Carolina, Clemson, Miami, scored a grand total of 26 points. That's, That's not a good... That's not a good look. And then to cap it all off, last night in Atlanta, mm. Mississippi just 
boat race Louisville. So it, it, it was, it was a grim, grim week for the league. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Mackenzie Milton in Florida state, that was storybook stuff. And Florida state's fans were awesome. And that kid coming back from the leg injury that he did to come into that game only because Jordan Travis's helmet came right. off. I mean, you can't script that stuff. No, that was amazing because the helmet pops off and then you think, okay, what's he going to get? Is he going to get one snap? Is he going to get the rest of the series? I mean, the thought is he comes in, he runs a play and comes back out. Uh, It's not hard to put your helmet back on, but he did just enough with that one snap, I guess, that kind of left him out there. And then, boy, that that did turn into such a feel-good story and – you know, rooting certainly for that kid. But uh, if you're an ACC fan, you were really hoping that that result went your way. Is it an overreaction to think that the league is going to have a bad year because they had a bad week one? Yes, absolutely. That being said, there aren't a lot of chances Mm -hmm. to change the narrative. Yes, you've got some games left with, with Notre Dame. This week, Pitt goes to Tennessee, NC State goes to Mississippi State. But are Mississippi State and Tennessee any good? You know, by season's end, are they going to be much better than 500, especially in the SEC? Tennessee, probably not. Mississippi State, eh, maybe. So it, it's it's going to be hard to change the narrative, whether the narrative is based in reality. I don't know. I mean, Clemson's defense is clearly elite. Mm-hmm. And if DJ Uyunglele doesn't throw that pick six, Clemson and Georgia might still be playing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> deadlocked at three. I mean, <laughs> yeah. The question though is, was that? I mean, Georgia's got a pretty good defense. So, so yeah. let's not. It's not like Clemson right. went out and laid an egg uh, offensively against somebody who was subpar. But Clemson is built to score points against good defenses, right? That's mm-hmm. the thing. When you're a good team, you can beat other good teams in their area of strength. Clemson's offense never got going. Is that Georgia's defense? Is it ball game number one, new quarterback? Or were there some concerns there, David, that you said, I don't know if Clemson is going to be Clemson offensively this season? Offensive line was an issue last year, and it was a huge issue Saturday night in Charlotte. I believe Georgia had seven sacks. And now some of those were on Uwe Ungle. He held the ball too long. But you just can't get your guy sacked seven times. You, j- you just can't. I don't think there's any question, though, that Clemson is still the class of the ACC, and that brings us to this week's edition of Take It or Leave It. Thank you, Mike. With Clemson's loss to Georgia and the overall weak start for the ACC, the conference won't have a team in the college football playoff this year. Take it or leave it, and let's start with Mike. I'm going to leave it. I think that Clemson still gets there. I I think um, the distance, and we've talked about not that this is a good thing for the ACC, but the distance between Clemson and everybody else, um, I think is substantial. And and I think that this is going to be one of those years where um, as long as Clemson doesn't have that weird like loss to Pittsburgh or, you know, it's done that over, over time, um, as long as they take care of business in the ACC, I think at year's end, Clemson is going to be regarded back where it was. I think people will look at the opener and I think one, they're going to see that Georgia ended up being uh, what we think Georgia is. I think Clemson's defense is going to be nationally elite. Um, I'm super intrigued and, you know, it came up with, with Aaron McFarlane. I'm super intrigued by South Carolina and uh, Shane Beamer. I don't think they're going to be great this year, but that's going to become a game for Clemson. um, Certainly that you have to have. And, the, the last regular season game. But I, I think Clemson rides its defense all year. I think the offense finds itself midway. Um, and I think they avoid stubbing their toe the way they have in, in past seasons. Uh, and I think they still get there. Okay. Thanks, Mike. David? I'm going to leave it as well. Clemson's made the playoff in seasons it lost to Syracuse. So in, in, in that regard, losing an opener to a Georgia team that we anticipate to be in the national conversation all season is hardly a, a resume buster. However, the Tigers' remaining schedule is not good. You know, Shane Beamer may be a feel-good story, <laughs> but 
South Carolina, beating South Carolina in the season finale is not going to move the needle. Similarly, beating South Carolina State and UConn in your other two non-conference games may you know may hurt you more than it helps you. And if and if you get a six and two or five and three coastal champ mm-hmm. in the ACC title game where you're a 21, 28 point favorite, how much good does that do you? Then you're relying on results in the rest of the country and just hoping that you can squeeze into that 14 feet. Yeah, David, if, if I'm Clemson, I'm hoping that either Virginia Tech or Miami uh, has a remarkable season and, and and goes into that ACC title game as real competition so that that victory, <laughs> assuming it is one, is a victory that, that scores you some points. Um The biggest thing for me, because you're right, like you lost to Georgia in a close competitive game in the opener. It doesn't take you out of the picture. But what it does is it puts your back to the wall the rest of the year. You can't stub your toe in one of those other games, right? You can't uh, have an off day against Syracuse or Pittsburgh and um, take that loss and say, well, dominant the rest of the year. I think now if you stub your toe in ACC play, that takes you out of the picture and and that... um, that ratchets up the pressure in, on Clemson uh, in an interesting way, I think. Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen a two-loss team in the playoff yet. Right. And the first one is not going to come from the ACC. It, it's just not. Yeah, so there you go. If you're a Clemson fan, you're rooting for the Hokies the rest of the way. Run the table, be as strong as you can be going into that title game. It was just week one, so a lot of maybe overreactions. But boy, David, it was it was a lot of fun. And the, the crowds were great. Some of the games were entertaining, if not great. And I can't wait to do it all again next weekend. Absolutely. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to Teal and Barber on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your favorite pods. And please consider supporting local journalism with an online subscription to the TD. You can find special promotional offers available at richmond.com. Today's show was produced by Dean Hoffmeyer. Teal and Barber is a podcast of the Richmond Times-Dispatch and richmond.com. For David Teal, I'm Mike Barber. Thanks for listening. Be healthy and safe. And please join David and me again next time.